me thank you once again for providing me this opportunity and it's really an honor for me to be the part of this prestigious series the ms swaminathan centenary lecture series and i'm grateful to dr somya swaminathan madam and also other swaminathan research foundation leadership for providing me this opportunity so in this presentation i would like to share some of my views on genomics for food and nutrition security but also would like to pay my tributes to professor swaminathan in fact when i will present you will realize that some of the work what we are doing this is towards realizing the vision of him and in this direction as we all know that we had a big loss of losing professor swaminathan last year but at the same time many of us we celebrated his legacy his work and the whole world though we are missing him but we we he has left a legacy and all of us are trying to take this legacy forward and uh, though i paid my tributes in the different articles in the case you have not read then you can you are most welcome to see on my blog or even the nature india and not only that even the national academy of agriculture sciences and also in the review of agrarian studies where we contributed we 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 shared some of my experience while receiving the mentoring and then supervision or inspiration from professor swaminathan very briefly i would like to mention and especially to our colleagues young colleagues because professor swaminathan has been an inspiration to all of us for me i met him first time in 99 and this picture when i was very young boy and was doing the phd i came to mss srf in 1999 where dr lalji singh at that time point in collaboration with professor swaminathan organized a conference of adnet and i remember that i received the best poster award there and i received that an envelope with the 2000 rupees and this i got it from that hands of professor swaminathan this was really a big moment for me in my life after that i met him in 2000 in the second international congress in crop science congress in germany and while i was in germany for my postdoc from 2001 to 2005 i stayed in touch with him through letters and emails but my interaction started with him when i joined icrisat in 2005 and i had a privilege of interacting with him more frequently we had several occasions and i feel really privileged to visit ms srf many times and also inviting him at icrisat so and this you can see several pictures and not only me he was very close to my family as well and whenever he was coming to icrisat we were always inviting him for a cup of tea or so so this is really good one thing also i would like to mention because as you know that i have been working in the area of genomics so whenever he was asking me about the genomics i say sir i am working on this or this he will be always listening very patiently and will be asking different kind of question what does it mean or so and whenever he comes to icri said we used to take him to the lab explaining that what is happening and this was really wonderful and very and you can see a person like him always listen these things and why i'm trolling all these things because when he was coming and he was asking all these question about the genome sequencing in one meeting i think this was in 2013 or 14 when he came there and i told can i have your consent to sequence your own genome and he laughed what does it mean i say well i tried to convince him but thing which i want to tell that on his 19th birthday in 2015 i had a privilege to present the genome sequence of professor swaminathan to him and uh, after posing numerous question about his genome he asked me or he reflected and this was really very inspiring he says when i was working on my phd i began to understand the double helical structure of dna but i never imagined i would one day hold the fully decoded sequence of my own genome in my hand so such moments and interaction have served as a beacon of inspiration for countless young minds in agricultural sciences both in india and internationally 
Another incident I would like to share, and this is in 2016, when he was there for one of the meeting of FAO as a keynote speaker, and I was also there. And I remember that Paras Raman from MSSRF, he was there, and at that time, Sarol was already in the wheelchair. So I asked him while having a cup of coffee with him, Sir, you have already contributed so much to international agriculture. Perhaps you should not strain yourself by traveling so extensively. But before I could finish, he replied, Rajiv, interacting with young minds like yours at scientific meetings keeps me abreast of the latest advancements in agriculture science. That's what motivates and energizes me to travel at this age. I said, wow. And he added, I can't imagine just sitting in my office when I believe I can still make a contribution to society. So this was the way that Professor Swaminathan was working. And I fondly remember his last email, which I received from him in May 2023, when I received that fellowship of the Royal Society. And as you can read that message, he says, I'm very happy that you have been elected as a fellow of that Royal Society. And so kindly accept my congratulations and very best wishes on your fully deserved accomplishment. So I always feel very inspired whenever I receive an email. I'm not sure whether Dr. Madhra Swaminathan is there or not, but I would also like to highlight her email. And this is especially this sentence when she mentioned, my father is happy and has already written to you. I believe while talking to me today, he said a fellow is someone who makes an original contribution. So these are the ways that I have been inspired by him. And when we are talking to Royal Society, I would also like to share another event or incident. In Royal Society, they have a charter book. And this charter book was created in 1663 after King Charles II granted a second royal charter to the organization establishing the structure of the Royal Society. And since the first signature was entered on its pages on 9th January 1665, this volume has recorded the signatures of new fellows and foreign members as they were elected every year. And last year when I went there, so Royal Society generally asked that, do you want to see some signature in particular? And as you can imagine that I requested to see the signature, the very first signature of Professor Swaminathan, which was inscribed in 1973. And I was so excited, you can see with my smile, that, wow, I found the signature of 1973 from Professor Swaminathan. And finding and beholding his signature filled me with elation. It was as if I was floating on cloud nine. Moreover, I felt privileged to sign the same book in 2023 in, the fifth, in my 50th year. And now the same Royal Society, they have invited me to write a biographical memoir for Professor Swaminathan. And I'm working on this thing with... Uh, Dr. Sharad Kumar and also Dr. R.S. Paroda. It's really a privilege for me to contribute to this one. And I'm also thankful to MSSRF for providing us the permission and several pictures. And this memoir will be available very soon. And this will be in public domain. So this is really very nice. And I'm not sure that many of you might have seen this picture of Professor Swaminathan from Royal Society. This is one of those rare pictures. And I got it from Royal Society when he visited way back in 1973 or so. So these are some of those things that I wanted to share, especially with my young colleagues, that these kind of people, they have been inspiring that whole generation and many of us to contribute towards the food security and nutrition security, some of the key things which have been very close to his heart. And right now also we have lots of challenges for food and agriculture. And this is not that these challenges are new. We had, in fact, Many of us, or at least I have read in the books and many of senior colleagues, they know that sometimes way back in 1960s, in the context of India, we had really serious challenge of food. There was a book published by Dr. Paul Ehrlich in 1968 titled The Population Bomb. Even on this book in the cover, you can see this highlighted in yellow color. This was written while you are reading these words four people will have died from starvation and most of them children. So this is a very uh, discouraging or disappointing book or so. Even some of the paragraphs, and if you would like to read, the battle to feed all of the humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. 
at this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world that rate. They wrote, I have yet to meet anyone familiar with the situation who thinks that India will be self-sufficient in food by 1971. I don't see how India could possibly feed 200 million more people by 1980s because at that time, the people were about 400 million people. But this was this time, but at the same time, and this was the time that Professor Swaminathan together with Professor Norman Borlaug, they were sowing the seeds of Green Revolution. And we all are aware, well aware of the success stories of the Green Revolution, where we had this Green Revolution serials through the transformational genetics in the form of dwarfing genes, RST alleles, in the case of wheat, as well as in rice from the Dr. Yon Longping from China. So the world will really started to have huge amount of wheat and rice and salute to the Green Revolution heroes. Of course, Professor Swaminathan, Norman Borlaug, Yon Longping, and also Professor Gurdev Khosh that they contributed a lot in this direction. And as a result, if you would like to see in the context of India, from 1961 or so, now if you see this is the old data 2018, but things keep on increasing. If you see the cereal crop, cereal production has been increased more than 200 or 300 percent. Cereal yield has increased. So even population is increasing with this rate, but that grain production has been increasing with much more faster pace. With the limited land use, so you can see that land use has not increased heavily. And so we were able to produce more cereal crops. Now, India, where we, Paul Ehrlich wrote those kind of disappointing words, now you can see that India has become a food prosperous country or from a grain deficient nation to food security for all. Now, India got 1.4 billion people, more than three times than what we had in 1960. But currently, India harvests around 110 million. Now, this, this year, there will be going 110 million tons or so and is one of the lead exporters in the wheat. Even those calories, if you would like to say, the per capita net availability has increased to about 312 grams per day from 500, from 312 grams per day in 1950s to 512 grams. So, though we still have some issues of those uh, malnutrition and food security, but good news is that Ehrlich's prediction about famines and massive deaths were found to be false. And Jonathan Last in 2013 in the New York Times, he wrote the Population Bomb probably was one of the most spectacularly foolish books ever published. And he wrote this thing in his book as also in the other things. So I think these are the, how this could happen just because of the contribution of Professor Swaminathan. Today, the world can produce almost three times. And I was talking earlier about India. Now I'm talking about the world almost three times as much as cereal from a given area of land that it did in 1961. Yield outputs have increased more than 241%. Cropping intensity has been in increased. Lot of infrastructure, especially for irrigation facilities, etc. have been increased and improved farming incomes, mechanization. But at the same time, we also have had that fertilizer uses as well. So all these things happened. And now if you would like to see the whole world map and you would like to see the yield, countries like India, China, Europe, North America, or in Australia where we are having this green wealth, you can see very high yield, green color thing, yellow color thing. There are still some regions left in Africa and some other places where they still have that huge potential to enhance the yield. So these were some of the success stories. And this is, we can feel very proud of that, that agriculture, because many times agriculture is not appreciated. On the other hand, human health, which is important, and both things are important, is appreciated much more than agriculture. But this is the way that you could see that when people were predicting, but all those predictions were false because we were having enough food. If you would like to see the current scenario, we know that by 2050, we will be having 10 billion population. And uh, now, if you would like to see, even at this stage, one in 10 people do not get enough to eat. Hunger is also on the rise in the Western Asia as well. There are conflict and climate crisis, and there are several places on the earth they are still very hungry. So, I mean, this is not that we have solved all the problems. So, this is 
not very good situation. And in terms of the nutrition, nowadays we are focusing a lot and many of us, including WHO, FAO, in sustainable development goal, everywhere we are talking about the nutrition, which is very important. But, and this is much more important in ongoing conflicts and geopolitical issues worldwide. So I think that these are very important issues. Climate change is posing another threat. And all these issues, they, they, they are basically putting scientific community that we need to produce more food and we need to contribute towards the food and nutrition security. These other things are becoming important now, but if you would like to see again from Professor Swaminathan, in 1986, he wrote this book called Global Aspects of the Food Production. Also, he gave a talk in FAO at that time point, and he, these are some excerpts from the 2017 from Chennai. And he also wrote one article in Indian Journal of Medical Research in 2013, where he highlighted that food and nutrition security, they are uh, intermittent for that uh, word. And since only a food-based approach can help in overcoming malnutrition. So, so he was so visionary that he was looking all these things much more ahead than many of us can think. And in, yeah, so in 2017, he stressed the need for a change in the emphasis from food security to nutrition security. Of course, this food security, nutrition security is a result of several things. So not just crop improvement, but policies and a lot of other stuff. But now people like us who are working in agriculture space, in crop improvement space, we need to think in this direction. And we, what we are thinking nowadays that we need to have the sustainable agri-food system. Why? During last few years, 40 to 50 years, we know the temperature is increasing during the climate change. Greenhouse gases emission is also going higher, population also increasing. Now, what we need to do that to, in, to feed this ever-growing population, we need to do several things. We need to bring this temperature down. We need to bring this carbon dioxide gases down. At the same time, we need to produce the crops which are climate resilient, which can give more food, which can provide more nutrition and not only the crops, but we are talking about agri-food system where the trees, fisheries and a lot of other stuff comes. So we need to work in this direction that how we can, we can contribute toward the agri-food system. And this is some of this work of Dr. Swaminathan that he, that, that he has inspired me and I have been working for last 20 years in this space, in different capacities, in the different organization. What is required, what we are doing, and I will share some, some examples, some work from ICRISAT, some work what we are doing now at Murdoch University. So what is happening that if we need to develop these crop varieties, which are climate resilient, nutritious, with higher productivity, sustainable, we need to integrate genomics in the breeding program. We call it this genomics assisted breeding then only we can be, we will be able to address or to achieve this at least three SDGs, zero hunger, good health and well-being and climate action. What is this genomics assisted breeding? When I was in Germany, together with Professor Andreas Granat and Professor Mark Sorrells, we gave a concept of integration of genomics and breeding and we call it genomics assisted breeding. This was in 2005. This was the time that genomics was just booming up and then we had the first genome sequence of the rice crop. So we provided a concept in the 10th anniversary issue in the trends in plant science, feeding the world plant biotechnology milestone that what we can do. I'm so happy to mention that during last around 20 years or so, there are lots of advances in the genomics assisted breeding and there are lots of success stories. But for doing this thing first, you need to understand the genomes, you need to understand the traits so that you can work, you can, you can define the appropriate combination of alleles, etc. In this direction, when I was working at Icrisat on the crops like dryland crops, pigeon pea, chickpea, pulvillet, peanuts or so, together with several ICR institutes, state agricultural universities in India, many organizations from all around the world, in China, in Europe, Australia, North America, we developed several international consortiums 
and then we led some of those consortium. We decoded the genomes of pigeon pea, chickpea, palmillate. So genomes basically that you understand the entire gene repertoire and you are having all these genes in your hands. And not only for the dryland crops, many other crops which are important in Asia like sesame, mung bean, ajuki bean, pea, etc. So we have been working on all these things. But does this mean that if you find like in 28,000 genes are present in the case of chickpea, whether all 28,000 genes are expressed in all the tissues at all the time? Probably not. So we need to understand their gene expression in temporal and spatial manner. And for that, we developed the gene expression atlases for chickpea, pigeon pea and groundnut. This is one thing. Second is that initially when we were developing the genome assemblies, they were on the, based on the short sequencing reads. But with the time, we kept on in advancing the genomics technologies. And during the last few years, we have been developing these high quality genomes. So in this paper, the same legume genomes, what we presented earlier, we brought them at the chromosome level and we call them pseudomolecule. And we got the chromosome length genome assemblies as well. This is an example in the case of palmillate, for instance, that our earlier genomes, they were very, like for instance, this was the TIF 2017, but then after that we developed this platinum standard reference genome. Now you can see that we have improved these genomes very high level. We have addressed lots of issues. So you can do a lot of work. And now even in the case of soybean, we have developed the genomes and we call them gapless genome assemblies. We developed this thing for the two soybean cultivars also in collaboration with United States and Hong Kong. And one of my colleagues, Vanka Garg, so she did really good work on this aspect. So, so we have been able to assemble those genomes now, gapless genome, and we can get, and I will talk about later, telomere to telomere genome assemblies as well. So this is one way that you can understand the genes. But now if you would like to use them for the breeding with that objective of the food and nutrition security, the next thing is that we need to understand the genetic variation. And for that, there are large scale germplasm available in different gene bank, either this is in India, in NBPGR, ACRISAT, or CGR gene banks, or here in Australia, Australian grain genes. You got huge germplasm collection. And we all know that during the case of this, now when we talk about the breeding, we had the domestication, we had the breeding. So because of these two bottlenecks, we lost many favorable alleles. And now what we need to do, we need to go back to the land races, we need to go back to the wild species, and we need to understand their genomes, and we need to use those genes which we have lost. And based on these things, there is a concept of the pen genome where people were talking at that species level. We moved one species a step further and we say when we want to target the wild species we should not just talk about pen genome we should talk about super pen genome at the genus level so because of these kind of concepts we started to do these pen genomes and super pen genomes like in the case of chickpea we got eight different wild species so what we did we assembled the genome assemblies for eight different wild species so not one genome eight different genomes and we recently published this thing and here we have provided the Sizer superpen genomes. We got an idea, information on the genes present in different wild species. And we had many colleagues involved in this project from ICRISAT, from many Indian organizations, and many other organizations in Australia, China, and United States. Other one is in the land races. So now, for instance, in the case of pigeon pea, we targeted about 292 pigeon pea lines coming from 23 countries. In the case of chickpea, we targeted 429 chickpea lines. And then we just also did the phenotyping for the traits in which breeders are interested. And while combining these things, we got the genes associated with the different traits. Not only in this case of chickpea and pigeon pea, we did similar kind of work in the case of peanut in collaboration with Guangdong Academy of Agriculture Sciences this year. And here we also developed the genome variation map in the case of peanut. And we got that genetic association with more than 28 agronomic traits. We are doing similar kind of work in the case of pea with Chinese Academy of Agriculture Sciences where we have developed the pen genome in the case of Ajuki bean with Beijing University of Agriculture. So nowadays our lab, they are working on different crops and idea is that how we can understand this genome architecture, etc. 
when I was at Ikrisat, we embarked on a big project and this was the sequencing of more than 3,366 lines. This work was done in collaboration with Ikrisat, ICARDA and many other organizations. And this was a huge work. And based on this thing, we developed a chickpea pen genome. We got several new genes and then we extended this study further by sequencing more than 10,000 lines. This is the world's biggest project earlier, the 3,001 was the big project and right now this is the biggest project of sequencing of plant genomes where we sequence more than 10,225 lines from all over the world and not just for fun but to understand the genes associated with different traits. Now we are going not only for the genes, we are identifying the haplotypes, we are developing the haplotype maps, we are getting the hotspots where we can get more genes and this is really huge information and very useful resource for the breeding. Next thing is that so far people have been developing those genome assemblies. They already moved to that chromosome scale level, but they still they are not reaching to the full chromosome which is called a telomere to telomere. So recently we have provided this concept that why we need to have the telomere to telomere genome assemblies so that we can unlock the full potential of plant genetics for the crop improvement. And inspired by this work, now we are the partner in several international genome consortiums, not for one genome, but larger genomes, like PySum 50 plus genome sequencing consortium being led by Canada from Murdoch University. We are the partner there and we are contributing towards sequencing of these genomes where we are having 50 plus and these, each genome will be that DNAVO genome assembly at telomere to telomere kind of thing. And from Australia, we are contributing three, but two other accessions we are sequencing from Mexico and Afghanistan. Another consortium, we are the part of that one, International Favabin Pen Genome Consortium. Favabin is a big genome. And here again, this is being led by IPK. And also now one of my colleague, Muru, who is moved to the Texas. So those colleagues, they are leading this consortium. We are the partner there. We are also contributing several genomes in that even Favabin. Not only that, here in Australia also, we are targeting 15 Australian chickpea varieties. Chickpea is very important crop in India and also here in Australia. And now we are doing this assembling of those 15 different genomes. So this will be also a pen genome of Australian chickpeas. And there are a lot of stuff whether we can do it. I would also like to highlight another big project and would like to invite that in the case if some colleagues are interested we will be happy to work then together with IPK and Helmholtz University of Munich we are leading international initiative on development of heat pen genome and haplotype catalog we had several meetings in 2023 24 and even in September 2024 plan is to sequence or to assemble the heat pen genome for 100 different wheat varieties from different countries and many countries are the partner there and we are looking for more countries which are missing here. And in Australian perspective, we already have targeted about 15 wheat varieties which are coming from the different states. We are working in collaboration with different partners and a lot of sequencing work has already started as and now genome assembly is underway. So this is the way of the genomics that how and what you can develop now decode earlier. We had that tough time to even sequence one genome Right now, we are talking to T to T genome and we are going in thousands and tens of thousands. We have not reached yet in the range of the hundreds of thousands, but that day will also not be very far where we should be able to sequence or where we will be talking in sequencing hundreds of thousands of the genomes. Anyway, this is one part. Second is we need to translate this research. We need to, again, our goal is how we can contribute towards food and nutrition security. For that, we need to understand, we need to associate those genes with the phenotypes. And many countries, many places, phenotyping is just really a bottleneck because you need to understand, you need to evaluate your germplasm in that. Glass houses, greenhouses, field conditions, etc. And you need to collect that phenotyping data. In some cases, we collected the phenotyping data, we associated with that genomic data. And now in the case of chickpea, groundnut and pigeon pea, we were able to map more than 20 to 50 traits 
like drought, heat, salinity, ascocyta, in the same thing in the case of groundnut, late leaf spot, leaf rust, iron deficiency in the case of pigeon pea also. So we have been able to deliver that molecular markers associated with the traits in large number of crops. And this work again in collaboration with Indian Institute of Pulses Research, Directorate of Groundnut Research, many state agriculture university, IRI, many other organizations in India because these were the colleagues who did a lot of hard work. They did a lot of phenotyping, collaboration and of course outside India as well. So this is that based on the collaboration and partnership. This is not work of just one person or one institute, but multidisciplinary, multi-institutional contribution. Once you got those genes in your hand, next thing is how to mobilize them, how to bring them in the new genetic background. And for that, we had these discussion way back in Nature Biotechnology in 2012, like MABC, MARS, they are the different approaches. But when we did the discussion that what is the challenges and we realized several challenges. One is that if you would like to use them in the breeding program, one, the genotyping cost needs to be cheaper so that breeding programs can afford that genotyping. Second, our breeders need to be skilled that how to integrate those things. So they also need to be trained. Third, that we need to have this support from the public policy or from the government because in some of these crops, when we started chickpea or Pigeon P, even at that ACIR label, we did not have that uh, ACRIP trials, that guidelines for testing molecular breeding products. So, and we worked at that time point, Dr. Shopan Datta, he was the DDG crop science. We worked with his office. We worked at that time point, Dr. Mohopatra, also in the Director General of ICR. So, we did a lot of work with the directors of the institute, Dr. Radha Krishnan from DGR, Dr. N.P. Singh from IIPR. And of course, Dr. Bhardwaj, Dr. G.P. Dixit, there are many colleagues from India. We worked with them. So anyway, we tried to address each of these three different components. What we did, together with the Gates Foundation, I led one project. We call it High Throughput Genotyping Project. And the purpose of this project was to bring the genotyping cost lower. Through these innovative approaches and with that economy of the scale, we were able to bring the genotyping cost for up to 10 markers the cost was $1.5 per sample, including the DNA extraction cost. And I feel so proud to lead this project that now this project is being or has this legacy. And now eight different CG center, 13 years program for private companies. And they're using this project outputs in 28 countries across 18 crops for more than 100 trades or so. So this is the way that this project brought the genotyping cost down. Second, Together with my colleagues, especially here, I would like to mention Anu Chitkineni, who was that manager of the uh, Center of Excellence Genomics and Systems Biology at ICRISAT. She worked with me and together with her and many other colleagues at ICRISAT, we organized 15 different training courses where we trained more than 485 breeders, not in the data generation, but in the integration of the genomics and the breeding program. From India alone, we trained more than 365 breeders from Eastern Southern Africa, 49, Western Central Africa, 40, and other country, 31. So this was a huge work during the last 10 years or so. And as I said, we also worked in the terms of those guidelines or so. And then those lines, what we did, this molecular breeding lines, they were tested. So like breeders, they did this introgress and work. We provided the genotyping support. They did this evaluation across the different environment or so and following all the guidelines. Many of these lines were released as a commercial or as a varieties in many countries. And here, this is the success story in the case of chickpea. And here, many of you already know from India, Dr. Bhardwaj, very leading chickpea breeder from IRI. And together with him and many other breeders from Indian Institute of Pulses Research and in fact from IRI as well, we were able to deliver several chickpea varieties which are coming through the genomics assisted breeding. Now you can see the yield. Generally, you are having 1 to 1.5 tons per hectare and you got the varieties more than 2 tons, 2.5 tons, 1.9 tons per hectare, etc. They are for the drought tolerance. Same thing in the case of Fijiram wilt coming for like Pusa Manav and here is coming from the University of Agriculture Sciences, uh, uh, Gulbarga and many other organizations. So we kept on delivering these kind of uh, varieties. Now, many of these varieties, they are already grown by the farmers 
in the case of ASCO Catabolite from Punjab Agriculture University, etc. Not only in India, in Ethiopia also. Because we were leading this project from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and two varieties, Jale 2 and Grar, they were released in Ethiopia. Like my breeder's friends, Niguse Grima, Asnake Fikre, they played a key role. And you can have these varieties up to 3.8 tons, 2.1 ton per hectare. And these were coming. And the drought, drought is very complex trade, but we were able to deliver these varieties. Similarly, in the case of Kenya, for instance, several lines have been delivered. In the case of Kenya, in collaboration with Paul Kimurto, in the case of Tanzania, lots of stuff that has gone to the farmer's field and those people, they are really working or they are being grown by the different farmers, etc. In the case of peanut, in Karnataka state, we were able to release the variety of folio disease resistant and uh, this is the guy, Dr. Ramesh, what he did this great work. We had first set of that uh, high olic acid varieties and uh, lots of now these varieties in the case of Ghana. And Dr. Radha Krishnan played very important role in high olic varieties, etc. So we got lots of varieties in the different crops. And this was the document from the FAO in the case of chickpea alone, and you can see that in the case of chickpea alone, more than a dozen varieties have been released in India, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Tanzania, same case in the case of uh, groundnut, in the same case in the case of pigeon pea, etc. So these are some success stories, how you will be able to deliver those genomics in the breeding program. I think somebody is doing the new sense that started to putting uh, that screen. I don't know that Gaitri or somebody, you can address the issue because they started to use the sketching on the screen. Anyway, so now coming back to some of that work, what we are doing here now in addition to those legume work now at uh, Murdoch University, we are working on wheat. Wheat is also very important crop for Australia. This is key crop, one of the leading crop. And what is, we are doing here that in wheat, we are improving wheat for the nitrogen use efficiency because right now farmers, they use huge fertilizers. And these fertilizers is not being used or nitrogen is not efficiently used by the plants. So there are lots of leaching and then going soil pollution and creating that in that contributing to the greenhouse gases. So now our idea is that how we can make that wheat nitrogen use efficient. Similarly, another project on the heat tolerance, how we can enhance that heat tolerance in the case of wheat. And we recently organized a conference, International Wheat Congress in Perth, where we brought more than 950 people from more than 52 countries. Now some summary is also coming in the nature in one or two pages. So like this will be shared in public domain. But So this was a big story, success story. And we have discussed a lot with different breeding programs or so that how these approaches can be moved further. In the case of legume genomics, we are working on that project on genetic gains. One of my colleague, Ruthvik Varmuk, is leading this project. And here we are working on three different crops, chickpea, fava bean, and lentil. And we are using this genetic diversity. We are working with different organizations. Another project is with the University of Queensland about the nitrogen fixation in the case of pulses crop. We are also working on other projects. And this is enhancing the heat tolerance in the case of chickpea drought tolerance in the case of chickpeas. So we are working in range of the projects dealing with those climate change related issues, etc. The other thing, now my group is also working on the horticultural crop genomics because not only just legume and cereal, horticulture crops, especially fruits and vegetables, they also play a very important role when you are talking about the nutrition security. And now here in Australia, we are developing advanced genomics platform for Australian horticulture. In another project, which is the race project, we are developing the cost-effective genotyping technology. And then recently, we are having another big initiative called Genetics for Next Generation Orchard. And this is in led by QUT. We are also leading one of the node at Murdoch University. So these are another big project that about the horticulture genomics. So what I want to say that we have been using the genomics in different crops. This is either in the wheat or legumes and the horticulture crops. Now, very quickly, if we deliver the varieties, does this mean that we can realize the full potential of genomics? Probably not. Why? And especially I'm talking in that developing countries where we are having the breeding program, public breeding programs, and then farmers, they need to be provided the seeds, etc. And for that, we came up with this concept 
that rapid delivery of the new cultivars to farmers is really required because many times breeders, they develop great varieties, but they do not reach to the farmers. So our concept was that now the varieties, either they are coming through the traditional breeding or through genomics or even through GM or gene editing, we need to ensure that they are reaching to the farmers in the real time. So we need to extend in the seed system. We need to think about that integration of those decision support tools in the farmer's hand because now farmers, many of the farmers, they got the access to the mobile technology. And I know that MSSRF, they are doing great work in this particular area in addition to many other areas. The other thing is that we need to provide the better agronomy to the farmers so that they can realize the full potential of those genetics which is present inside the seed. And not only that, countries like India and many other countries in Africa, we also got a lot of post-harvest losses, so we need to address that issue. When we talk about enhancing the farmer's income, we need to connect the farmers to the market. And for that, we need to think about the value addition as well. We need to bring these processing plants also next to the farm houses or so, so that not only the farmers, but even the consumers can be benefited. So we had this kind of concept and we implemented this thing in one of those big projects from the Gates Foundation Tropical Legume Project, which had the three different phases. I had a privilege to lead the third phase and some part of the second phase as a principal investigator and that some project coordinator with me who worked, Chris Ojibo, Emmanuel Monio, and several other PIs and the, some pro people from the Gates Foundation. Dr. Sadiq Abete was also program coordinator and Dr. CLL Goda was the PI of earlier phase, first phase and the second phase as well. So this was a big project. More than $67 million investment during that uh, maybe more than 14 or 15 years. And this project scale was that in the 13 different countries in Africa, India, and also Bangladesh. And we had working on the six different crops in many countries. And what we did that we addressed some of those issues, what I was talking. One, that we were using the breeding genomics and developing those climate resilient variety. But second is that now that how breeders can continue to make this breeding program much more stronger, how we can continue to deliver more genetic gains. So this was the second approach. And through this one, we delivered several varieties, including this high on it, grounded varieties, which I was talking earlier. And anyway, so there are a lot of stuff in the, across the different crops. Third is, which is very important, building sustainable and inclusive seed system. Unless you are having these sustainable seed systems, you cannot make those, those uh, you cannot realize the full potential of genomics. You cannot talk about the sustainable agri-food system unless you got this really good seed system. And this was really big work. And we worked with the different national programs, private companies or so. In total, while well, together we were able, this project was, this project facilitated to deliver 304 improved varieties production of about 400,000 improved seeds, which could be grown in 4.4 million hectare area and which produce about 4.9 million ton grains, which is the value of about 2.6 billion US dollar across the 30 different countries during the course of 10, 12 years. Socioeconomics analysis indicate that this these projects, they helped about 22 million farmers across those 13 countries. And now some quick studies when we started the project, this is either Ethiopia, Uganda, Nigeria, Mali, or India, if you see these different figures, during those 10 years or those phases, production has increased, number of the productivity has increased, economic value has increased, and majority of time, everything in different crops have been increased or so. And we documented the achievements. This is not that there were always success stories. There were lots of challenges, lots of failures as well. We documented them in the form of some books, some articles and all these things. This is so that now the other crop community, other countries can learn the lesson and they can deliver these things. In fact, in terms of those impact of this study and Gates Foundation, they recruited an independent agency. And this was from that uh, events school policy analysis and research from University of Washington. And they did the analysis. And then they, their analysis indicated the average benefit to cost as ratio across segment is 16. This means that every dollar invested in TL, tropical legume, generated about $16 in value for a smallholder farmer. So this was that 
way that we were able to deliver through the genetics, through the breeding, through agronomy, through public policy support. And for this work, my previous organization increased and I feel very proud to contribute that, that, that we got this Africa Food Prize in 2021 for this amazing work across the 13 different countries. Anyway, friends, I wanted to highlight some of these success stories and would like to mention that the vision what Dr. Swaminathan had that to ensure this nutrition and food security, which is a big thing, we all can we all can contribute in this direction. And I think there are different ways. One is crop diversification is really essential for sustainable agriculture and ensuring food and nutrition security. When you talk about developing climate resilient, nutritious varieties, new approaches of breeding, including genomics, including GM, including gene editing. We need to use those kind of new approaches. We need to have the government support for taking all these products to the farmer's field. Nowadays, new approaches, including artificial intelligence, machine learning, and simulation approaches are expected to accelerate trait mapping, identify optimal parents, predict agronomic performance, of breeding population. Countries like Australia, United States, Europe, this is not a big problem because here the breeding is basically commercial breeding and they know that how to replace the varieties and farmers are also, they understand all these things. But now in the countries where we are having a small older farmers, we need to ensure that we need to have the rapid delivery system. Finally, international, national and local government agencies support and capacity building is a must for sustainable agriculture and food security. Finally, I would like to mention that as we contemplate the life and legacy of Professor Swami Nathan through this MS Swami Nathan Centenary Lecture Series, which is really fantastic and I feel really honored to be the part of that, let us carry forward the torch he ignited. Honoring his memory involves continuing the journey he initiated, a journey towards a world where no one sleeps hungry. He epitomized how science can act as a catalyst for positive change and showed that research can be directed towards addressing tangible challenges. His legacy continues to inspire researchers like me and policymakers to tackle the pressing challenges of our time from climate change to sustainable agriculture. With these words, I would like to thank large number of collaborators who were involved in this work, what I presented, and now many of our partners here in Australia, because we are we feel very privileged to have this support and collaboration with large number of partners. And thanks to Murdoch University Leadership, Grains Research and Development Corporation, and their leadership, Hot Innovation, and many other organizations. They are generous supporters for our research. And of course, my team which is having very young and diverse team. They are very hardworking people, including the senior researcher, postdocs, PhDs, and my colleagues from the laboratory. And so, so they are doing amazing work. Thanks to all of them for doing the great, fantastic work. And with this picture in 2015, when I was sitting in that feats of Professor Swaminathan, this is also one of my favorite picture, which we got in 2015 in ICRISAT. With these words, thank you very much and back to you now and we'll be happy to take up any question if there is a question. So.